Hello everyone, let's analyze. So this class is real analysis and we're going to start real analysis by essentially creating the real numbers. Uh, when I say creating real, the real numbers, what do I mean by that? Well, by, by axioms. What are the real numbers? What rules do we need? And given these rules, how can we minimize these rules so that the existence of the real number set is implied by the smallest amount of rules. So these rules, because they are just stated as true uh, and can't be proven, uh, are called axioms. So how do we create the real numbers? Let's start with a field. Okay. So a field is a set that has with it two arithmetic operations, addition and multiplication. Of course, we know that we can add numbers and multiply numbers, but again, we want to define everything carefully uh, and axiomatically. Okay, so we're going to give a precise definition of what it means to add and multiply. Now, by the way, the fact that this set is imbued with these two operations implies that any two elements of the set, when added together, yields another element of the set, and any two elements of the set, when multiplied together, yield another element of the set. Otherwise, um, if A and B are an F and A plus B is not an F, then it doesn't make sense what A plus B is because you're no longer in um, your universe. You're no longer in the set that you're existing in, the field. So let's go through the rules. Uh, the first rule is associativity. If I add A plus B first and then C, it's the same as if I added B plus C first and then A. Same thing for multiplication. If I multiply A times B and then multiply C times that product, it's the same as multiplying B times C first and then multiplying A times that product. Commutativity, which just means that order uh, doesn't matter. A plus B is the same as B plus A. A times B is the same as B times A. Distributativity of multiplication over addition. In other words, I can distribute the multiplication operation uh, to a sum. A times the sum of B and C is the sum of A times B and A times C. Okay, the identity. Uh, there's two types of identities and they each correspond to the two arithmetic operations. The additive identity is the element of F that we're going to call zero that when added to A returns A. In other words, A plus zero equals A, right? So we just define zero by axiom. And the central property of zero is that when you add it to any number, you get back the same number. There's also a multiplicative identity, and we're going to call it one, right? So A times the multiplicative identity is A, right? A does not change. In other words, a times 1 is a. Now, the additive identity and multiplicative identity sometimes have different names uh, in different sets. For example, when you're dealing with matrices, for example, uh, the identity matrix is typically referred to as I. But it's a multiplicative identity, even if uh, the set of matrices is actually not a field. So in addition to identities, there are inverses. Right, so again, the additive identity is 0. The multiplicative identity is 1. The inverse. For every A in F, that is, for every element of F, there is an additive inverse of that element. So the additive inverse is denoted negative A. And it's defined as such. A plus the additive inverse is the additive identity. In other words, we say an element is equal to negative A if when added to A yields 0. Now, notice we haven't defined subtraction, but now that we have this property, we can now define subtraction as A minus B is the same as A plus the additive inverse of B. We don't have to define subtraction as one of the uh, elemental arithmetic operations in our field. It results from the definition of addition and additive inverse. 
All right, now the multiplicative inverse, or reciprocal. For every element in F that is not zero, in other words, every non-zero entry of F, there is a multiplicative inverse, often called a reciprocal, that we typically denote a to the negative one, or one over a. And it has this property, a times the multiplicative inverse is equal to the multiplicative identity. In other words, an element is the multiplicative inverse of a if, when multiplied by a, you get one. So a times its multiplicative inverse, or reciprocal, is one. By the way, we now have a definition of division. When we say division, a divided by b, what we mean is a times the multiplicative inverse of b, which is only defined, of course, if b is not zero, because you can't divide by zero. So, those are the axioms of a field. Now, is that enough to define the real number line? Is every number that we think of as real generated from these axioms, implied by these axioms? Well, no. Let's consider the following questions. Are the set of integers a field? I'll let you answer that, but does 2 have a multiplicative inverse in the set of integers? Is the set of rationals a field? Is this set of four elements a field, O, I, A, B, where we define plus and multiplication according to these two tables? Okay, so uh, the answers to these three bullets are no, yes, yes. So the set of rational numbers is a field, but the set of rational numbers is a subset of the real line as we understand it because every rational number is a real number. And of course, this four element set is not the entire real line. By the way, if I restricted that set to just O and I and defined addition and multiplication in the same way, uh, it actually corresponds to the logical and an or and create a binary field, which is of huge importance to uh, computer scientists. So everything that we think ought to be true was not in the field axioms, yet we could imply them from the axioms. For example, anytime I multiply a number times the additive identity, I get zero, the additive identity. In other words, a times zero is always zero, no matter what a is. So what that means is, I'm saying when I get a times zero, I get the additive identity. In other words, a times zero, when added to any number, uh, is given the same number. So consider a times b, where a and b are arbitrary. b is the same as b plus zero. So a times b is a times b plus zero. Uh, and by distributing this product, I get this is equal to a times b plus a times zero. Since a and b are both arbitrary, and a times b plus a times zero is a times b, then a times zero is the additive identity. In other words, zero. The second lemma. The additive inverse is, is produced by multiplying negative 1 times a, where negative 1 is, of course, the additive inverse of 1. So to show this, we need to show that negative 1 times a, when added to a, is 0. So let's start there. a plus negative 1 times a is, because I can distribute products, I can also factor them out. It's equal to a times 1 plus negative 1. Well, the definition of negative 1 is the number that when added to 1 is 0. So that's equal to a times 0. And I know a times 0 is 0 from lemma 1. So a plus negative 1 times a is 0. That means negative 1 times a is the additive inverse. 
of A. Lemma 3. If A times B equals 0, then either A is 0, B is 0, or both are 0. I'll let you prove that one for yourself. Lemma 4. The additive or multiplicative inverse of the additive or multiplicative inverse of A not equal to 0 is A. In other words, if A is not 0, the reciprocal of the reciprocal of A is A, and the negative of the negative of A is A. I'll let you prove that one for yourself, but I will point out that it follows very straightforwardly from the definition of the multiplicative inverse and the additive inverse. Lemma 5, 0 equals negative 0. In other words, 0 is its own additive inverse. So we showed that the definition of a field is not sufficient to uh, define the row line for us. So we need to add more. So an ordered field is a set that satisfies the field axioms from the previous page, but also has the less than relationship with the four axiomatic properties in variance under shift. If A is less than B, then A plus C is less than B plus C. We're actually going to use that property quite a bit. Transitivity. If A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. The trichotomy axiom that says for every two elements in F, exactly one and only one of the following is true. Either A equals B, or A is less than B, or B is less than A. And invariance under positive scaling. If A is less than B and C is positive, then A times C is less than B times C. Could we prove at this point that the additive identity is less than the multiplicative identity? In other words, is 0 less than 1? Well, of course, we know that 0 is less than 1, but that wasn't one of the axioms. It means we have to prove it using the axioms. Now, 0 is not equal to 1 by axiom. That's stated here under the axiom of the identities. Right? So by definition, 1 and 0 are not the same. By the way, what would have happened if I had not included that in the axioms? Could 0 be its own field? So in order to prove that 0 is less than 6, we'd like to prove, or we would like to be able to use the fact that if a is less than b, then negative b is less than negative a. This is another lemma that I'm going to let you prove yourself, but let me go ahead and tell you where to start. If a is less than b, then I can add to a the sum of the additive inverse of a and the additive inverse of b. And I can do it to the other side and retain the uh, less than or equals. I think probably you can finish from there. Okay, so this brings us to our theorem for today. The additive identity is less than the multiplicative identity. In other words, 0 is less than 1. Is a result that must happen if my nine given axioms so far are satisfied. Okay. As I mentioned, 0 is not equal to 1 okay, by axiom. But the axioms don't say that 0 is not greater than 1. So let's just assume that for a moment. Let's assume that 1 is less than 0. Now, of course, that's absurd, but that's the point. We want to show that this assumption logically leads to a contradiction, which would have the result of proving our result by a method called by contradiction, also known as reductio ad absurdum, which literally means in Latin to reduce to absurdity, which is a very nice phrase. Maybe every time I prove something by contradiction, I should say, and that's absurd.
QED. Okay. Let's continue with our absurdity. T. Assume 1 is less than 0. Well, 0 is equal to negative 0 from lemma 5 and 6, uh, which is less than negative 1. Now, this makes negative 1, quote unquote, positive. In other words, a number greater than 0. Well, then by invariance under positive scaling, 0 times negative 1 is less than negative 1 times negative 1. Now, 0 times negative 1 is 0 by lemma, and negative 1 times negative 1 is also 0 by the previous lemmas. So, if 1 is less than 0, then 0 is less than 1. But 1 can't be both less than 0 and greater than 0. In fact, the trichotomy axiom forbids it. Therefore, we've proved a contradiction, which means it's impossible that 1 is less than 0. So if 1 is not less than 0, and 1 is not equal to 0, then 1 must be greater than 0. That's all for today.